Good afternoon and welcome to Montgomery College. Uh, happy Hispanic Heritage Month for all my Latinos and Hispanics and Latinas and Latinx is out there. Uh, my name is Ramon de la Cruz. I'm the Central Services Building Coordinator at Montgomery College in our CT building. Um, and I'm also chair of a group of Latino and Hispanic uh, staff members and employees and faculty members who have united um, to kind of work towards our Latino and Hispanic initiatives. So Hispanic Heritage Month, here we are celebrating with you guys. Uh, to my left, joining us on our panel today is Dr. Glenda Hernandez Tittle. Woo! Come on, clap it up. <laughs> Esteemed faculty member, obviously, by the round of applause. <laughs> uh, Carlos Sanchez, public safety and training officer here at Montgomery College. Give him some love, too. <laughs> and Dr. Hernandez Fujigaki. Uh, Latin American history professor. So the purpose of today's panel is kind of to help us explore identity. Um, as Latinos, as Hispanics, as Latinas, as Latinxes, we're seeing an evolution of identity come about. And when we got together to discuss it, we realized, wow, we, we had an hour, an hour and a half of time to really like figure this out. So grown adults are still trying to grapple with identity and figure it out. We figured it'd be advantageous to have this conversation with you guys. And uh, we will give you an opportunity for a Q&A. Uh, when we finish around um, 3 o'clock, we should be done around 3.30. So I will begin in uh, our first question, and we'll go and ask a question, and we'll move down to the panels, to the panelists, is uh, how do you self-identify? And we want you to share as much as you feel comfortable sharing. We don't want you to be uncomfortable. We want you to maybe be a, a little vulnerable because I think um, identity is such a personal thing and forming it and sharing it is, is difficult. It's hard to be on stage and you know, be super open about yourself and vulnerable, right? Nobody's perfect. We all have flaws and we kind of got to face them. And when you're up here, you kind of go through that in your head while you're getting your story together. So we will share our stories with you as honestly and as truthfully as we can. Um, and we want to stress that identity is a personal journey. So be accepting of each other, right? We all have a different journey that we're walking through. Uh, we all identify differently. You might, you might identify Monday and Friday totally differently because it, new information might come out. We know how fast information is coming out now. Uh, compared to the 1950s, we get about a week's information in an hour. So that's super fast. So if information is coming out that fast. Evolution is coming about that fast. And we need to like slow things down and have a conversation about it. See, so just what we think of as people. So, Dr. Jorge Hernandez Fujigaki, I'm going to start with you and uh, ask you, what can you share with us about, about identity and, and your self-identity and how you came about to formulate your own? My own identity. Well, that's a good question. Uh, I would like to quote from a philosopher, that, a Greek philosopher, a Greek, uh, 2,500 years ago. And I love this guy. And I hope that I won't be mispronouncing his name in English. I know how to pronounce <laughs> it, uh, his name in Spanish because I, I, I speak perfect Spanish, no foreign accent. Heraclito, with an H. Heraclitus. He lives 2,500 years ago. And I'm going to uh, uh, read what he has been quoting of saying, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for he's not the same river, and he's not the same man. Universal flux. Into the same river we step and don't step. We are and we are not. Until over 35 years ago, I live in Mexico City. And our self-ascription, we call ourselves Chilangos. If you have a stone this day for Chilango, you also use that pejoratively, right? And then over 35 years ago, I moved to the United States of America. And before I did, I became permanent resident. I was issued a permanent residency, OK? Three years afterwards, I became fully natural. I became a naturalized U.S. citizen, okay? How I see myself, what the strategic utility, my identity, my ethnic identity might have is contingent upon context, situations, right? I'm a Mexicano. I'm also a Latino, okay? And if you confront me because you dislike me, I will reclaim my belonging to the American continent. And even without any papers, I will tell you that I'm an Americano. Just I was born 
actually technically North America, but in Mexico. Okay, that's who I am. So we have somehow multidimensional. We wear different hats. I love that you, you raised some great points in that identity is certainly something that's in flux. Um, it's something that's static for a short moment of time until we get more information. Carlo, tell us about your, uh, your journey. <laughs> so I, I have a, a bit of a different experience, right? I was born here. Uh, my parents uh, are Salvadoran, and they actually came into this country undocumented in the 70s. And I didn't realize that or the importance of that until I was probably a teenager and more likely going into my 20s. Um, that they were undocumented until I was six or seven years old, right? And the sort of impact that that had in the world and the life that I lived at that time, which at the time just seemed normal, but now that I've kind of stepped out into the world, I see it wasn't necessarily normal, right? But normal to what standard? Because where I grew up, I grew up here in Maryland, I'm born here in Maryland, I, grew up in Langley Park. So that's all I saw there, right? With people that looked like me, family structures that looked exactly the same. We were in a little two bedroom apartment and it had a big closet and my uncle lived there, yeah, right? He had a little bed in the closet and I didn't find that weird at all, right? Um, it's family. Uh, yeah, it was just family and that's what we did, right? But as, as relatives came in every three or four years, it was a different relative that was living in that closet, right? Um, and so, for me, I grew up just, people ask me all the time, right? People that don't know, we get the question, so where are you from? No, where are you really from? Yeah, right? So <laughs> I say, oh, well, Maryland, what do you mean, right? And they go, no, 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 but like, where are you from? Like, here, I was born here. Uh, and then, you know, I try to be nice, so I say, well, you mean where, my, where are my parents from? Well, they're from El Salvador. And so I grew up under this idea of I'm a Hispanic, right, because that was sort of the term that everyone used. And it wasn't really until I was in college, uh, I was in my undergrad at Maryland, and I took a Latin American Studies course. And that was the first time that I was actually in a large classroom with other Latino students who had similar experiences to me up until that point. I mean, I went here for two years, right? And I had Latino students in some of my classes, but we were still, you know, this was a long time ago now. Um, we were still kind of growing and becoming a bigger population in, in higher ed. Um, so it wasn't until then that I got the sort of, the instruction of this is a Hispanic and this is a Latino and you're a Latino, right? You're both, you can be both. Hispanic just means I, you know, my parents come from a Spanish-speaking country. Spanish is technically my first language because I didn't learn English until I went to school at six years old. Um, but I'm a Latino because my roots are Latin American. But if you ask me straight up and ask me what I am, I'm gonna tell you I'm a gringo. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's how I choose to identify. So it really depends on the situation how I'm yeah. gonna tell you what I am. Yeah, absolutely. That's powerful. It's powerful to know that, that there's code switching and identity forming too. Um, Dr. Hernandez Tittle, would you like to jump in and speak on your experience? Sure. Um, so I consider myself Latina, um, but to be honest with you, when we talk about identity, I actually um, often identify, uh, you know, there's different identifiers. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, I identify as a Latina, but as a woman first, mm -hmm. um, because I think that when we talk about marginalized groups um, or just differences in equity, um, I've experienced that first. Um, but in terms of my background, I actually came to this country when I was eight years old. My uh, family is from El Salvador. And there actually weren't a lot of Latinos at that time. Now I'm aging myself. Um, but there weren't a lot of Latinos in, in Montgomery County at that time. In fact, I went to Rock Creek Forest, um, and they didn't have a uh, ESOL program at that wow. time. So I was actually placed in a, a full immersion 
program. We just talked about that in class. Uh, but the program is actually for English, native English speakers trying to learn Spanish, not for English language learners. So I think um, for me, my, well, I think for all of us, um, it is something that you continue to develop. But I had very few um, role models and being a Latina wasn't celebrated very much. He told me That's to be strong. candid. It's, this it's, is it's really beautiful. hard, it's by beautiful. the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> this you. is really hard. This is hard. See, and it's really hard. I am doing it because um, I didn't have a lot of role models. And I want to talk about this um, because now I see an amazing, beautiful, um, diverse population. And um, nobody talked about identity. Um, nobody talked about being proud to be where you're from, at least not, you know, um, in my case. Yeah. I think it is different now, and that's why when he asked me, I said, I really don't want to do this because <laughs> I, I knew that this, this is an emotional topic for me, but I do think that I have a responsibility now, like my lens has shifted, in that I have a responsibility to, to shift things and to talk about it. and. Um, to acknowledge that it's okay to go through different waves. Your identity is gonna continue to change and that's fine. Um, so I am a Latina, I'm a woman, and I'm an American. Thank you. You're Being vulnerable um, takes a lot of courage. So thank you, I appreciate that. Sure. Um, I don't have tissues. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I have an experience that, that's, I was born here in New York City, I was born and raised in the Bronx, New York, and I never felt like an American. Like never, like not in my house, not with my friends, not on the basketball court, not in class. At no point did I feel like I was part of this cycle. So I'm always looking for where do I fit in, where do I fit in. So hip hop culture was huge, right? Hip hop culture was transformative for a lot of us. Hip hop culture is what I latched onto. That's where I got my identity from, okay? So now I can identify with this. Um, I didn't have role models. I had the same issue that you had. It's like, you know, the role models that we have are stereotypical characters that, you know, TV puts on, like, to program you. You know, and when you reach a certain level, you're like, this is not good enough for me. Now I expect more. Now I expect a Cosby show with Latinos, right? How do we not have that yet? That's a crazy thing. All right, all right Lopez, George Lopez show. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I really like that show. Um, but I really didn't have, I struggled with that representation. I struggled with, with the representation in media. I struggled with representation in higher education and in elementary school, right? You're looking at a teacher and you're like, and then you get that one Latino teacher and you're like, yes, we made it. It's all right, he's PE, I'll take it. <laughs> Teach me some karate. Um, and then we get into an age of technology, an age where now identity is now influenced by genealogy, right? So now your identity, there's actual science behind your identity. And you have this identity that your parents gave you, right? We're Latinos, we're proud, we're Puerto Ricanos, you know? My, uh, my father was born in Puerto Rico, my mom was born here in the States. Um, and you have the identity you make with your friends, right? You're in school and you kind of form that part. So this, you know, speaks back to that flux of identity, how it's never, it's never static, it's always flowing. Um, and then, now, as a father, having kids and having to teach my children what their identity is and all the various parts of their identity as Americans, as Puerto Ricans, as men, as it's challenging. And um, I think having these dialogues is important because where else do we have the spaces to have these thoughts and, and to have these emotions run through us? Um, so. I identify as an American. Now I identify as an Afro-Caribeño. Um, Genealogy-induced identity. <laughs> and uh, a Latino. Hispanic, obviously, for the same reasons, right? We, we speak Spanish, that's our, that's our language. Language we learn kind of at the same time in a Thai race. And, and a lot of the factors um, that influence that identity are 
cultural representation, our media, our, the family unit, right? And the friends that you have outside, because those friends help you form that identity. So in that formation of your identities, and we'll start with you, Dr. Hernandez, um, what, what, what was influential? What was uh, an important part? Now we spoke about media representation. Sure. Um, that, you know, I, I actually didn't think a lot about my identity, you know, so when we talked about doing this, it, I think you think about it in a very fragmented way, you know, you think about it sometimes, but it's not like you say, I'm gonna have a self-identity reflection today, <laughs> right? Um, I do think I started, I, there was one uh, moment where I realized that I had issues <laughs> with um, self-identity and that I really had to revisit this, and <clears throat> it was actually about very weak, not too long ago, about five or seven years ago, um, I went to the Haku conference, and that is a conference for, um, it's, 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 uh, it stands for Hispanic Association for Colleges and Universities. And I was going there because it, the theme was how to support Latino students and being more successful. So I was interested, I wasn't presenting, um, I was just attending. <clears throat> so I, I didn't pay very close attention to the program. And right before the keynote speaker started, I realized, I don't know why I didn't think about this before, but I realized that the keynote speaker was gonna be this chancellor, and he was Latino. And I was really nervous, and I was afraid um, how, of how he was gonna do and how he was gonna represent Latinos. And it was just a crushing moment because I realized that um, maybe the reason I hadn't thought about it so much is because there are clearly invisibility, right? We talk about invisibility, and invisibility is, can be incredibly powerful in a positive way and incredibly detrimental. And this was my moment where I realized I am nervous for somebody because, you know, they they are Latino, how are they gonna do? And again, I think it was just a representation, a reflection of the invisibility that I have had in my life in terms of mentors and role models. Um, so that was really pivotal for me. Um, I think being here at Montgomery College has really helped me, um, just hearing that there are more Latinos in leadership roles. Um, there's Sonia Prunetta Hernandez, who is amazing. She's a colleague of mine and an um, and incredibly, like, just powerful advocate for Latinos. Um, and I think having that unity and just, again, more representation, seeing that, you know, uh, there's positive, there's role models, there are what we call vicarious experiences that are powerful and positive has really shaped me and it's, it's made me, that's why I'm here today, right now, because I want to do more. I, I want to um, enrich my identity in celebrating who I am as a Latina. So. Um, I hear that, I hear, I hear a lot of community, a lot yeah. of family. Yes, and, and my family um, definitely keeps me grounded. You know, like it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm the first in my family who, um, who graduated from college. You know, I got a master's, I got a PhD, I worked for the World Bank, USAID. They don't care. They're like, you are, you know, you know, <laughs> who you are. And um, my, my, my mother was very strict in terms of making sure that I kept my language. So thank your parents if they forced you to speak yeah. Spanish. Um, and I really bucked that. I didn't want to do that um, because again, it wasn't celebrated, right? Um, and now I, I've been able to travel and do so much and to give back because, um, I, because I am bilingual. Um, so I think those, you know, those are, that one moment I think was really big, but again, being here, um, having programs uh, like what you've started, having colleagues um, that you can identify with, just Absolutely. increasing those vicarious experiences yeah. has been helpful for me. Yeah, I, I concur with your reflection of your identity is very important in, in forming it and having representation that you can see.
-hmm. and leadership that you can see. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so on that note, I want to thank all of you for being here with us. Not that this is the end of the panel, but I'm a little <laughs> unconventional like that. <laughs> uh, but this is leading, and this is leading, and being vulnerable is leading, sharing your story and helping other humans connect. And us as Latinos and Hispanics, we're already a little bit more connected <laughs> for some reason. I haven't figured out what that thread of, what that fabric is that, that binds us. Um, but it's important to have those connections and, and, and maintain them. And then they help kind of recycle that identity. And wh what I found funny about that was how your identity doesn't change with some people, right? You have a sister or brother and be like, look, I don't care where you went. Right. <laughs> you're, st you're still Bobby. Right. <laughs> Carlo, tell me about you and uh, and uh, and what kind of influences. Uh... Yeah, it's it's kind of the the same thing, right? Family is is a big one, and I grew up in an environment like I told you, right? My parents came in undocumented. They got a residency. They became citizens in the '90s, and were so excited to vote. And so they really made a huge push to not want to have me feel like I was different, right? Um, and I ended up with this weird sort of dichotomy where outside in public, spoke English, right? You know, what happens is you become legal representation for your parents all of a sudden, right? You're like 10 years old Absolutely. and they get a weird letter in the mail and they're like, mijo, can you call and find out what this is about? Can you translate this letter for me? I need to go to the bank and do this stuff. Like, can you be there so you can help me figure out what, you know, what's going on? So at like 10 years old, right, 10, 11, you're already like the person that's going up to adults and asking questions and you're handling a lot of business, right? right? right. I mean, my parents bought a house when I was like nine and I remember being at the table and being like, no, you gotta sign here, <laughs> initial here, this is about lead paint, you know, like doing all that stuff. And I'm like nine years old, like what am I doing there? Um, but at home, right, the second part of that was that at home though, my mother did the sort of same thing. like. Language was so important to her. Culture was still so important for her, right? The food, the everything. And so um, it created this weird sort of fight for me because there was a, an external public me and then there was like the private me that I had at home with my parents and with my family. Um, and it's interesting because even now, um, and I was talking about this actually, interestingly enough, with a cousin the other day, how different we are, um, you know, people that know me sort of publicly, like I'm very, uh, I'm very outgoing, I can be gregarious, like I try to be very social with folks, but within my family structure, I'm the quiet, reserved one, right? And that's my role. And so even my wife commented on that and she said, you know, you're so different when you're with all of them because you, you turn into a different person, right? And that's that was such a huge molding for me so what happened to me was actually that um, my mom as happens with a lot of latino uh, families right so they become strictly they're, they're they're strictly religious in some way right and so my mom um, said you're going to go to a private school i'm not going to put you in public schools right i'm growing up in langley park um you know then they bought a house out in out in lanham that at the time the heart of, P, of PG County wasn't necessarily the safest area either. So they were like, yeah, you're not going to public school. We're going to do whatever sacrifices we have to make so that you go to a private school. So it's a private school that, you know, doesn't have ESOL programs. So I'm just thrown in with the other kids and they're like, you're going to figure this out. So I'm in kindergarten during nap time instead of, you know, and there's this, this woman, bless her heart. I'd mention her name every time I tell the story. Miss Christensen, if you're out there, thank you. Um, <laughs> she would sit with me during nap time and read to me. And I would sit in her lap and I would point at words and she would pronounce them. And that's how I learned English. So by the time I'm in third grade, I'm like in advanced reading and writing courses, right? I'm, I've been separated out, I'm, uh, you know, I'm doing all this stuff, which was a benefit for me. But what it did was that it created this really weird identity for me where I was in this private school, not surrounded by a lot of Latino students, not understanding that I was different, right? right? And it didn't really hit until I went to high school and my mom's uh, got a third job where she's cleaning houses um, to pay for tuition. And um, it turns out that she works at the house of a couple kids in my school. And so they found that as a reason to pick on me, right? Oh, your mom's cleaning our toilets, right? She's doing my laundry, right? Um, and that's when it hit, right? Oh, there's something different here. 
Uh, and really, that was the biggest sort of shaping for me was those high school years and kind of learning to be strong and, and resolved. And it actually makes me think I heard this Kendrick Lamar uh, song some time ago where he talks about how when he saw a couple people in his neighborhood that made it, one became a, a basketball player, one mm -hmm. became a rapper, that by the time that second kid who was a year ahead of him in high school was going to become a, a talent and was going to get out of the community, all he could think about was the fact that the percentages say that only, right, he says, one, one kid getting out of here is, is amazing, two is a miracle, three is not going to happen, right? So he's counting and he realizes two kids already made it out, I'm the third, I'm not going to get out, right? And that became really for me the big thing was looking around my neighborhood and going, oh no, if no one else is going to get out, yeah. then that, that shot exists, I'm going to get that opportunity, I'm going to take that opportunity. Um, and so all of those things shaped me. And then a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to actually be in elected office, right? I represented the, the, the same area that my parents moved into when they came into this country. I represented at the state level, and I learned a whole other lesson that all of a sudden, right, I have the ability to, to legislate, to pass laws that help the community that I grew up in, the community that I still live in. Um, and really quickly, the thing that people told me was, oh, you're a one-trick pony, you, you just do all the Latino bills, right? Mm. And I was getting that from people that were African-American, mm. uh, African-American legislators, right? And my return, my sort of retort to them would be, I wonder, I wonder if when the first African-American was sitting in this seat, in this body, if everyone turned to him and said, oh, you're just a one-trick pony, you're just putting in all the African-American bills, right? But that's sort of the struggle, and to me, ever since then, I mean, if I were to ask, right, give me the name of one politician that's Latino that you guys actually know, know their name. There's one I'm willing to bet, right? Everyone knows AOC. Maybe. Well, Maybe. <laughs> that did not sound very <laughs> responsive. Jeez. Um, but that's, but you know, that's really the struggle. We haven't gotten to that point yet, and so even though I left office and everything else, I said, you know what? My job moving forward is to figure out how to take who I am, that representation, try to understand that, and then figure out how to advocate for that, right? Um, and so all those things have kind of shaped me where now I'm just in this really strange place where my identity is, is, is constantly fluid now, just where it needs to be depending on what I think I need to push for. I feel like I talked a lot, so I'm gonna. No, that was great, because yeah. as, as a representative of people, obviously you have to shift, because you yeah. have to shift the concerns to, to your constituents' yeah. need at that point, right? Sure. So, you know, we, we got family and community, and over here I hear a lot of environment. I have a lot of, you know, where I was, where I was raised kind of helped me form this identity and, and, and the factors around that. Jorge, I know you have a, a total different take so let me, let, let's, let's hear what well, you Well, before I basically address the issue that you raised, I would like to respectfully disagree with Glenda about something that you said. You know, I don't want to glamorize the lack of structural representation of Latinos in positions of power in the United States. I don't want to do that. But there is no disconnect between you getting a doctoral degree and the lesson that your parents taught you. You know, because they are also winners. You know, yeah. immigrants are a very selective lot, wherever they come from. And I thought that I would tell, remind my students. And I, I told my students, uh, not suggesting that that's necessarily your case. I have a brother who is a doctor. He, he makes good money down in San Diego. Uh, he had a domestic worker that he brought from my hometown, okay? And I remember her sibling with whom we basically grew up in Mexico City, Cecilia, Cecilia. They were there poor. My father was a successful merchant in my hometown. And one day we were heading to my same hometown. And she told me, Jorge, now that you are coming to my hometown, I would like to introduce my mother to you. We walked to the outskirts of my hometown. They live down by a, basically a cliff, no indoor plumbing, no toilet, no electricity. It was depressing. Her mother was in her late 30s with tuberculosis. And I really cared for Cecilia, but she, after all, was our domestic worker. Well, to make a long story short, her sister, Maria Luisa, moved to the United States of America. 
a domestic worker. A few years ago, my mother told me, you, you remember Maria Luisa? Of course I do. Maria Luisa? Guess what? She could not believe it. Her son is a doctor in San Diego. The son of a domestic worker became a doctor in the United States of America. It's a testament to the resilience, the values that were instilled on this young man. You see, and for me, when we talk about role models, yeah, we certainly, when we talk about role models, we might be thinking about, uh, you know, Latino that hold master's degree, professional degree, doctoral degree, that's important. Or, or people who are successful in business. But some of the most successful people are basically live at home, right? Live at home or own parents. Now, I would like to address the question that you raised. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, number two, what factors contribute to the development of our identity? Um, all my formative period took place in Mexico, unlike you. You were brought to the U.S. when you were eight years old. You, you were born in the United States of America. Um, and when you, uh, you know, my identity in Latin America as a Mexicano has been historically shaped and reshaped by the interaction with two very powerful countries. One very powerful at the time, Spain. Spain. Then over the last 150 years, the United States of America. Whatever I am, whatever I am the process of becoming, is fully interconnected with the United States of America as a hegemonic power. Shaping forces, you know? The annexation of half of Mexico by the United States of America as a result of a war that took place between 1846 and 1848, and how Mexicans, over 130 million of them, internalized that. Then you move to the United States of America, and then you become an alien, right? An alien with U.S. citizenship, right? And we talk about being an Americano. If you press me, yes, I'm an Americano, 100% Americano, you see? Uh, for other people, I um, for, will forever remain an alien. And when they refer to my national background, they say, you are a Mexican. I know that being a Mexican has a strong pejorative connotations. You know? It's not, a, they are not necessarily, they are not, it's not a term of endearment. And I, I carry my Mexican nationality with pride. You have the same pride that I have for living in the United States of America. Uh, but I think it's forever, uh, uh, you know, as you know, ethnic identity is very fluid. And my own, basically, ethnic identity is primal, that is primordial, somehow dwells in a space of a territory that is highly contested, a true, battle, uh, you know, like battlefield. You know, some time ago, uh, a Mexican-American judge, I guess, that was born and raised in Indiana, went after Mr. Trump after Mr. Trump. And then he said, the Mexican judge, <laughs> the Mexican judge. So he was making this American-born judge and forever an alien, you know? And it's quite, uh, quite ironic because the subject of my doctoral dissertation had to do with Mexican steel workers and Latino steel workers in, in, in the northeastern part of Indiana and South Chicago. I interview some old ladies, now older, uh, my age or older than me, I call them old ladies, senior citizens. They were proudly American. And I asked them, are you Mexican? I said, no, you are a Mexican, tú eres Mexicano. We are Americans <laughs> that have Mexican ancestry. Their parents moved to East Chicago in Northwest Indiana in the 1910s. And they were on a defensive mood always forever on a defense. Say, don't make me me a Mexican. My parents were immigrants from Mexico, but I I'm an American citizen, you see? Uh, and that's what I am, you know, American from the legal standpoint because I'm a naturalized U.S. citizen since the year 1988 um, because I was born in the Americas. So was I. I don't have that take. <laughs> Actually, and we, this is the beautiful thing about identity, it's, it's personal. Can we, can we, I mean, we're having a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Can we talk about that for a second though, the judge thing? Yeah. Because I had just entered office at that point, right? 
And can I tell you how striking that statement was to me, the way that went public? Oh, this Mexican judge who's not mm -hmm. going to be able to look at my case fairly, mm -hmm. right? Because I want to build a wall. <laughs> it, it struck, that struck the core of me because here I am entering this position, right? Where I'm like, this is incredible. I can't believe that the son of two undocumented immigrants can get to the point where he's part of representative government. And it immediately made me think, no matter what I do, right? No matter mm -hmm. what I do, that's always gonna be the thing that they're gonna point at first, right? Mm -hmm. If, 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 and, and it actually happened to me. I put in a bill that was very unpopular because um, it had to do around how state agencies deal with immigrants and, and cooperating with ICE and everything. And I passed it out of the House, and it was the first time that one of these bills had gotten moved out of either chamber here in Maryland, and I passed it out of the House. And they have a press conference the next day, and Jeff Sessions was still in office. And they asked Jeff Sessions, did you hear about Maryland and this bill that they just passed yesterday? And he just went on this tirade, and all I could think is, if they identify me, he's not gonna say American. He's gonna say that Salvadoran <laughs> legislator, right? Even though I've never lived there for more than four weeks at a time, right? <laughs> um, but that really struck me. Like it, it really, it, it, was a, it was a really stark cold reminder that in some ways, no matter what I do, they're always going to fall back to that, right? And that's always going to be a difference for me. So it's interesting that you brought that up because that, to me, that had such a huge impact when that conversation happened. And I hear there was an opportunity to teach there. And I think, I think that's, that's a strategy we should take away from this, is I think identity is something, if it's personal for us and it's in flux for us, then it's gonna be in flux with somebody trying to determine what our identity is. So you know, that, that should be something that we should be able to kind of close the cycle on um, as we share our, our identity and how it changes. You know, we should be able to express that and, and um, and be able to bring people in to how our identity is formed. Um, when, when did that happen? In the, two, uh, the I think he, he was, ago? yeah, it was the lead up to the election. He wasn't, I don't think, I don't think he was president yet, right? When that three happened. Years ago. Yeah, so it was about three years ago. So it's interesting because our next question is what challenges do we face mm -hmm. in forming identity? And this is a challenge we face, right? Society, right? Because right? right? we can be who we want to be, but then we have to convince people that that's who we are. <laughs> And that's the perception part of identity, right? Uh -huh. Because our identity is within, it's personal, but then the perceptive part that's out in public also becomes integrated into our identity. Because, you know, if, if you're what I call kind of, you know, a sheep-minded person, mm -hmm. you can be led astray, right? Somebody can tell you, no, this is what you are. This is the box. <laughs> you're this stereotype, you're right? You're a Chicano, you're a criminal, you're a predator, these <laughs> words that I put out there to describe our black and brown brothers. And, uh, and, and it's important to be independent enough and have a, a, a foundation of your own identity to withstand aggressions like that. Because I think when, when you try to explain identity to somebody, I mean, we, we, we live in a time now where people can willingly choose where they identify, right? And some people don't really respond well to that. But that's their choice. Right? That's a personal choice. Like, you know, you can't take that away from that person, that person's experience. Um, so if society is a challenge, how, how would you guys recommend, and I'll let you jump in, whoever feels comfortable uh, jumping in on this one, how would you, what, 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 what kind of skills, what kind of toolkit can we, can we share from our own experiences of how we deal with when people challenge our identity, um, try to classify us, try to box us in, stereotype us, I think what I would, what I've learned and what I would recommend is try to stay as true to yourself as possible. Um, even, you know, if it feels really difficult, um, I've been told I don't sound like a Latina, you know, oh, your accent, you don't sound like you're from El Salvador, you don't look like you're from El Salvador, I don't know what that means. Um, wow. So, I remember um, when I was a high school teacher, I was a high school teacher for Montgomery County Public Schools, and I started um, a Latina leadership club. And um, I, again, wanted to be supportive in 
being someone, being a role model, um, being a presence um, to those students because I hadn't had that. And we invited someone over, um, I actually don't remember, <laughs> he, he was some representative of, of something and we invited him to this club to come and talk to us and I distinctly remember him saying, him celebrating who he was and he was like, you know, you gotta make sure you speak Spanish and I'm seeing all these, you know, women um, with highlights and coloring their hair and I was like, uh, you know, I have highlights. Um, so I, I, it was just so confusing for me. It was just like, oh, uh, here I am trying to identify, trying to be a stronger, uh, have a stronger presence for my students, for the community, and then to have a, a very different perspective of what I should be. Um, so I think you hear, you hear that all the time. I personally just have I've heard so many contradictory messages because identity is so individual and so fluid and so personal. I, I think that's the takeaway. It is you. It is personal. And it's going to change. And that's OK. That's OK. Like, give that <coughs> gift to yourself to be who you want to be, regardless of how other people identify. And you know what? Everything that he said, there wasn't anything wrong with it. That's fine. That's great. But I do like my highlights, you know? And I. Um, do Spanglish and I do Spanish sometimes and I do English sometimes and I do love merengue and I do you know like reggae I mean so it, it's me and um, don't be persuaded by trying to fit by somebody else's definition of who you are you know and I think it's hard especially when when you're younger you know you just and and, and especially with social media when you're maybe supposed to look a certain harder way, now that's right uh, look a certain way sound a certain way be you um, so I know that's easier said than done at times but I think that would be you know that's definitely been my takeaway through my experiences and and for challenges I mean social media that's a huge challenge now I mean if I got bullied in school I didn't have to worry about it till the next day about 7.30, 8 o'clock. Like there's no break now. Mm -hmm. Like you go home and that's continued online and comments and this and that and Snapchat and gifts. It's too much, it's, it's overwhelming. Technology is a little hindrance in, in, in um, <coughs> informing identity. Does it help at all? I think, I think. I think so. I think so. I think um, I think when when you think about representation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Then then in, in that sense, in that media sense, now I see myself more reflected, mm -hmm. right? Whether that's just you know the times, mm -hmm. whether it's more saturation of Latino Hispanic leadership and, and representation. But that you know I kind of see that coming out of a a down phase in terms of visibility for Latinos, Latinas, Hispanics. Yeah, I mean I think it's still. And, and it's a challenge and it's an opportunity, right? Because it's, you know, what Glenda said earlier, where, yeah, you're growing up and you don't see people that look like you in positions of prominence, which I think is, mm -hmm. right, the, the difference. You don't, you don't, you don't see um, people, you know, you don't aspire, like I wanted to, <laughs> growing up, I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to be a lawyer. I, the only lawyers that I ever saw were the guys that did the commercials on, you know, in between the <laughs> telenovelas. No injury. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Yo hablo tu idioma. You know, that guy. Um, and so that's, that, that was the only sort of, right, so that, so that's really, that was the challenge was that, but it was also an opportunity because for me then I didn't feel sort of bogged down of this is the lane I have to stay in because this is what I'm supposed to be, this is how I'm supposed to act, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I honestly just, you know, it, and it's funny that Glenda mentioned it, but so I, it's the opposite for me, right? Like <laughs> on, uh, on the weekends, if I'm doing stuff around the house and I gotta run to Home Depot real quick, I'm like in a t-shirt and some shorts, I got my, my ball cap on and I walk in and my wife one day was just walking and she's like, I lost you in the crowd, like I had no idea. <laughs> 
<laughs> where you went, right? Um, I can't like I can't hide that, right? Like like my mom tells me all the time, you look exactly like your dad did, right? I've seen pictures and there there is no hiding it. Uh, my dad on my on my dad's side, both of his parents, they had very native features, um, and on my mom's side, they they had more Spanish, they were lighter skin, lighter colored eyes, right, and all that. But my dad's blood is so strong, like that native blood is so strong that I, I remember going to El Salvador when I was younger, and um, and they could tell that I was not, that I was American as soon as I opened my mouth. Because my Spanish, as much as here my Spanish is impressive in the United States, it is not impressive in El Salvador. Not transferable. Right? Yeah, yeah. I've got very limited vocabulary. Um, so they could tell immediately, right, that, that I, I was American. Um, but I had this lady once that told me, oh, pero tienes cara de indio, right? Like, I've got a face yeah. of, like, a native, yeah. right? Like, I just have, I have a native face on me. I can't, I can't hide that. But what I ended up doing was uh, learning to develop different characteristics, different ways that I, that I talked, right? So if I was in school, I, I had a different sort of affect with how I talked, right? And I'm probably talking like that right mm -hmm. now. Then when I went back home, once we lived in the heart of, of PG County and, you know, and I had to be around those guys and all of a sudden I had that draw, right? Like, I, 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 talk, I can talk like a Prince Georgian with the best of them right. if I need to, right? And I could drop that in real quick. Um, but then if I was around uh, my family, even when we were talking Spanish, I, when I was pronouncing words that were English, I pronounced them with an accent, right? <laughs> Like I would, you know, but those were all things that I was doing to survive, so I could right. fit in and and feel like I was a part of it, right? I wanted to I wanted to have that feeling with my family, where they were struggling with the English language, so let me struggle with them, right? 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 Let me, you know, strength in numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when when my mom would be like, "Hey, go get me the Vicks Vapor Rub," right? I'd be like, "Here's the Vicks Vapor Rub. I got it, right? <laughs> Vicks Vapor Rub for those." Guys. <laughs> it heals everything. Right? Everything. Everything. Um, <laughs> But, but, but it was also an opportunity for me because the one thing that, that sort of transpired as I got older was if there's no one else ahead of me, all I have to worry about is the fact that someone's going to be there after me, right? And I get to choose how I want to present myself. Right. And if I can show that next kid, that whoever's coming in behind me, that they can be any of these that they want to be, then that's the opportunity. It's a challenge because... It's hard, right? Like, how do you, you know, you go to college, and all my cousins, we're all the first generation that's going to college at right around the same time. So we're kind of latching on to each other, but we don't know any other Latinos that have gone to college right. to be like, oh, so how do you handle this stuff, right? Like, we're, we're like calling each other uh, on landline phones back then um, <laughs> to be like, hey, so how was school? And, you know, just try to figure out how to, how to develop things. But now it creates still an opportunity where most of us are still trailblazers. And so we can create that image and make a wider lane, a wider path for anyone that's coming in behind us. You know, yeah. Yeah. Now that you talk about that, you know, about the media, going back to what you mentioned, the power of the media and uh, the power of key uh, players, in this case, how the vision of a president and those who support can come so in some way, shape and reshape the views about Latinos in the United States of America. You see? Uh, the demonization of, uh, of Latinos through the demonization of Mexicans, Mexican immigrants, right? Um, and how basically this stigmatization in some way put us all in the same basket, you know? And I understand when uh, they attack undocumented aliens, and that's part of this language of ethnic conflict, you know, I call them unauthorized aliens, <laughs> undocumented aliens, and others call them illegal aliens, right? Uh, and how this criminalization of immigrants eventually also has had an impact on us, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Uh, if you speak, if I speak, if I do good, I don't speak on behalf of Latinos. I speak on behalf of Dr. Hernandez or Jorge Hernandez. If someone rapes, if someone kills, 
That person doesn't represent me, nor it represents 60 million Latinos in the United States of America. Right? When a white person kills someone, he typically represents himself. He doesn't represent the majority of whites. Right? That's a good point. That's so a good point. Uh, that, that, that's, that happens. And I think that when we talk about no one has a monopoly over discrimination. Uh, and I have empathy for you because you were raised, born, you were born in El Salvador, you were born in the United States of America. You go back to El Salvador, and I can bet that someone reminds you, even when in your family, that you don't belong there, that you somehow existentially trapped. Mm -hmm. Right? You you are not quote unquote a real American, mm -hmm. but nor are you a Salvadorian, right? And we experience discrimination. Uh, most of my professional, uh, uh, basically, career had taken place in the U.S. Years ago, maybe over 20 years ago, I was spending some time in Mexico. I applied for uh, at, uh, like a, a position. I think an adjunct faculty position in my home state my home state, they have uh, very robust programs for, um, for foreign students. Most of them come from the U.S., some programs. It's called uh, Universidad de las Americas. Wealthy Mexicans send their children, as long as, you know, foreigners. Uh, they interview me. I already have a, a doctoral degree. I have at least maybe 15 years of teaching experience in the U.S., and they like me. And then I met with the chair of the department. He said, Jorge, everything is fine with you, but you have a very thick accent in English. He said, you know what? I cannot get rid of my accent. If you wanna, uh, if you wanna uh, have someone that speak flawless English, bring a person with blue eyes from the United States of America. I'm just a Mexican like you. <laughs> so he said, no, no, don't, don't take me wrong. Don't take me wrong, you are fine. Did I eventually offer me a job? Did I take the job? I did not take the job. Hold on, they offered you the job even after that? Well, well, oh, I, 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 I had experience at least when it comes as a professional, more discrimination in Mexico yeah. like in the United States. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Discrimination is a challenge, even culturally, <laughs> amongst ourselves. I mean, just on that note, when I go back to Puerto Rico, it's the same thing. I said Negrito, I said Lindio, you know what I'm saying? It's, and my whole family is, is light skinned. So I grew up yeah. questioning myself. I grew up questioning what's wrong with me, why I'm this color, why I'm not the color of the rest of my family. And those are thoughts that when you're, when you're, when you're young and you're forming your identity, those could damage if you, if you don't have a way to, to grab on. Thank God I have my dad. My dad was brown, brown like me, <laughs> loved it. And I'm like, all right, man, I can see. I'm from there. <laughs> And that gave me that little bit of validation that I needed to, found, to, to, to form that foundation of my identity. That gave me a starting place. Um, so shout out to my pops. Yeah, that's definite. Um, another thing that I heard that there were some challenges were obviously safety, right? Um, government policy. So I work with a group of Latinos here at the college. Uh, it's called ALMA, Advancing Latino Male Achievement. Uh, Latino males are our lowest uh, graduating population at the college. We decided to put some, some focus on. And some of my students have, have opened up to me and said, you know, on my FAFSA this year, I didn't claim myself as a, as a Hispanic, as a Latino, because I'm worried, because my parents are not documented, and I don't want them to go look at my taxes and then go back to them and find out, you know, and be the cause. So now higher education and somebody trying to figure out how to pay for their education is becoming a catalyst for stress, because now they can't even go through the cycle the way we've designed it. So there's different tools that I think we have to you know, work on as, as, as Latino leadership, as Hispanic and Latina leadership to kind of provide for our, for our uh, students a little better in that regard. Microaggressions are super hard too, right? Because somebody's saying, somebody, somebody's surprised that I'm Latino, right? Because they think I'm Indian, they think I'm Muslim, they think I'm Pakistani, something else. And I speak Spanish, they're like, wow, you can speak Spanish and your English doesn't have a Spanish accent. <laughs> it's like a surprise. And that's something that you have to be conscious of. That's a microaggression. That's, some, that's a stereotype coming out in a way that, you know, they're trying to make it seem like it's cool. 
and the technique that I have struggled with, <laughs> what I try to do is I try to teach. You know, I try to say, you know, maybe it's somebody who I have a relationship with and I can laugh it off with. And I can be like, oh, no, no, and then just add some information about it, context, right? Maybe it's somebody that I have to address it with and be like, no, this is not cool for you to say, right? Maybe I expect you to know more than that. Teaching moments are important. And it's, it's, it's for me personally in, 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 in identifying and explaining my identity and helping other people with their identity. Um, it's, been, it's been the biggest challenge is, is, is trying to develop that toolkit and, and, and stay calm because you get emotional, right? You react in that moment. Somebody hits you in the heart. Oh, what do you mean my English is good? <laughs> that hits you. Even, even if you have tough skin, it hits you. Um, so there's emotional intelligence that goes into your processing of that microaggression, right? First of all, validate it. Say something that validates it for the other person. We have programs here that are like, ouch, you know, say, say things like that. Que latino, you might say, coño. But, um, and, and touching back on technology and how technology can help with forming identity, I did my DNA test. I learned that I have African roots. I have Moroccan roots, I have Native American roots. Without technology, how would I have known that? When, when that genealogy has been robbed from me through history, through the diaspora, through, you know. So in that way, technology, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a weird balance. And I guess it's like everything else, it's in how we use it, how we employ it, that's gonna make it effective for us or not. Um, so at Montgomery College, what resources can we offer to students that you're aware of? And that's not only limited to the college, they say the community. Um, in terms of, for Latinos, for Latinas, for Hispanics, for Spanish people, Salvadoreños, Puerto Ricanos, Dominicanos, Colombianos, todos nosotros, what do we have, what, what do we have to offer? Um, I, can, I can start with ALAS. ALAS is a group that we're putting together. It's called Advocacy for Latino Academic Success. And under ALAS, um, we have ALMA, and ALMA is Advancing Latino Male Achievement. Both of these programs, supported by Student Affairs, um, by the President's Advisory Committee on Equity and Inclusion, um, to try to provide more equity in services that we offer to populations of students, and specifically for populations that are not performing as highly as they should. Um, so those are two. Uh, resources we have here at the college. You can reach out to myself, uh, Ramon de la Cruz, R A M O N dot D E L A C R U Z at Montgomery College dot edu. Um, and we can help you out with a bunch of resources, with guidance, with advising, with registration, with questions, um, even with clothes for an interview. So we have, we've, we've asked a lot of our Latino staff and Hispanic staff at, at the college to come up out of their closets. And Let's help our students make this interview. Let's help our students make this impression. Let's go beyond what's expected. So those are two programs that we got here. You guys know of any? Carlo, any in the, in the larger uh, state body that? I you? mean, there's, uh, there's always tons of, of, of things. I think here at the college, honestly, I think over the last couple of years, the college has done a really good job of trying to um, guide guide uh, employees through a better understanding of culture and diversity. And what it's done though is it's created a better environment, right, where you can really feel more comfortable approaching people. And you can see it reflected in sort of the makeup of, you know, are we, are we where we should be in terms of numbers of, you know, faculty positions and administrative positions and all that? Probably not, right? But it's an ongoing process. Um, but there are more friendly, similar looking faces available in all sorts of different places here at the college where, you know, I, I think back to when I was coming here almost 20 years ago, that wasn't as prevalent as it is now. And so, you know, for me at least, I think one of the, the big learning lessons was if I have a question, you become, so it's weird, right? You become very self-reliant when you're a 12-year-old attorney for your parents all the time, 
So you just figure out, like, I'm going to figure out how to do this thing, whatever it is, because that's just what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and so I really, I, I had trouble in higher education because for a long time I was afraid to ask someone for help. Mm. Right? One, because I didn't want to show weakness because there ain't no one else that looks like me around. Right. So they're going to think that we're all weak, right? And I'm not going to show weakness. But secondly, it felt like an unfamiliar territory to me. It was, it was foreign. Um, and so I was scared. What are they going to say? Are they really going to help me? You know, what's going to happen? And it wasn't until I broke through and just said, hey, I need help, right, that um, I realized, like, oh, everyone actually does want to help me. They want to help me succeed. I just can't be afraid to reach out, right, and actually ask that question. Um, you know, I, I think if we look at, at counties, the big counties, Montgomery, Prince George's, the state overall, there's, there's a lot of good resources available. I think the governor's got a commission on, on Hispanic and Latino affairs. You know, we've worked on uh, Promise Scholarships, which makes community college um, practically free, right? Or, um, you know, there's been work on expanding the DREAM Act, on trying to make uh, college debt free for everybody here in Maryland. So I think there are, there are a lot of different groups, a lot of things that are going on. But honestly, I think it's finding that community, whatever's close to you, and just finding someone that you feel comfortable opening up and asking for help. Um, that's really our biggest barrier, I think, sometimes, is just that inability to say, hey, I need help. Who can I ask to get help? You know? That's powerful. That's a powerful observation. Ramon? How much yeah. is more good? Uh, <laughs> I would like to comment something about yes, this. Please. I mean, uh, I, you you have the practical knowledge that I lack mm -hmm. because <laughs> you, you you were in politics. Sure. And I assume you are still in politics. But uh, this kind of this kind of events are extremely useful. You see, uh, years ago we used to celebrate. We used to have like a, an event that will. Uh, that will specifically somehow recognize Latino students at the college, okay? I understand there is no more. Uh, I mean, that we now basically organize, uh, celebrate um, our students' accomplishments at a college-wide level. But something that, uh, that I would find quite useful is to, to share the success experiences of of people like you, you see? Because, real, uh, you know, success is a very relative concept, you see? Uh, and I always tell my students, uh, my brother is a very successful doctor in the United States of America. But then you have to ask me, and I know, I'm the expert, how successful my family was financially in Mexico before he moves to the United States of America. And the answer that I will give you might be different from the answer that other students might give me. I had a, a, a former a classmate at the University of Chicago um, who is a professor at the Paul University in Chicago. A very smart guy, Juan Mora. He spoke Spanish like a campesino, like a peasant from Mexico. <laughs> his formal level, level of, uh, his formal knowledge of Spanish was not academic Spanish that I spoke before I moved to the United States of America. His, his parents worked in the fields, farm workers in the fields. And he obtained a doctoral degree from one of the best universities in the US. That's success to me, you see? And we have to share these stories of success too. And I'm not talking only about the parents. I mean, the, the, the children of this immigrant, the, chil the, the immigrant themselves, Right. you see? Because you want to see reflected, basically, on these uh, stories of success. At the same token, I think we ha it's important for us to, to establish a dialogue with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with people that are not necessarily Latinos, and also among Latinos. You know, Glenda, uh, I think you mentioned, sometimes people uh, ask me if I'm a Latina, you see? I'm not sure that you don't basically in your external demeanor uh, or uh, perhaps in your racial phenotype don't fit that uh, stereotype about how Latinos look like, right? <laughs> or uh, Ramon, right? 
Uh, and something that sometimes people don't know, that among Latinos, you know, the, the fairest, basically, whites of all in the Americas don't live in the United States of America. They live in Argentina and in Uruguay. <laughs> Most of them 100% whites, fully transplanted Europeans. And this is something that people have to know. Right. right, and that in country like Puerto Rico, in country like like the Dominican Republic, certainly Brazil, and even places like you are, might not be familiar with, like Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, there are people of African ancestry that might recognize that connection with Africa, or might or might deny that connection. Right. And it's something that we have to basically uh, establish this kind of communication of dialogues. Agreed. I think I think Latino culture, Hispanic culture, Latina culture is is bigger than us, <laughs> right? We have Japones and Mexicano, maybe Moroccan and uh, Puerto Rican. I don't know. <laughs> so should I do the math on the DNA? It's hard to read that thing. You know, you talk about <laughs> Japones, and I, I, maybe you heard that. Yo, my, uh, the chair of my department, he's some political science department, that. You know, people have certain certain cues of how you you who who you are. You know, talk about the the connection with Asia. I have been in Vietnam. I have been in Thailand. I have been in China, and I have been in Japan. And there, I'm I'm a native. You know, as long as I don't open my mouth, I'm <laughs> Japanese. I'm Vietnamese. I'm Thai, and that fit me well because I can blend in with the locals. Right.